Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and today we are talking about marriage. Uh, in the time of the Restoration, there, there were some problems with marriage, and it's one of those weird situations where there's actually resolution of the problems. Kind of like how in the in the restoration, the people of Israel were getting lazy about building and not prioritizing the mission given to them by God. And then they were rebuked and called to repentance and they actually repented. And it's so exciting because that like never happens in scripture. <laughs> um, oh, so, things are actually happening the way they're meant to. Yeah, we're actually seeing repentance, <laughs> which is great because that's our lives, right? Yes. All right, so this is kind of a climax, in a sense, of the Old Testament theme of marrying within the covenant. That is, not marrying outside of the covenant. <laughs> uh, could you give us a rundown of maybe a few examples of this problem cropping up before, Greg? <clears throat> well... There's that whole thing about the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair and took them wives of all that they chose. And no, those are not demons intermarrying with human females. It's the covenant line, the children of God marrying with unbelievers because they're pretty. And we... Well, why did God let them be pretty? <laughs> Now, that is a very interesting question to which I have no immediate answer beyond the obvious <laughs> because he would. Uh, God has not taken away from fallen humanity um, most of the external blessings. Most people get up and find that they can breathe and that their hearts are pumping and that gravity hasn't failed and that there's still a sun in the sky and that they have two arms and two legs and two eyes and all that that there's still roses and there's still a blue sky mm -hmm. and there's still pretty girls and handsome men. God has not taken away. He could have. He chose in his, his overflowing mercy not to. And so it, 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 and he can take it a step beyond this. It's also true that some of those pretty handsome people are really nice. Sometimes they're nicer than Christians. <laughs> and so there, there is that temptation there, but I, this person likes me. I like, I like him, her, he, she, um, would make a great spouse. Uh, I'm sure we could work that, that, that faith in Christ thing out later. Right. Uh, Someone so nice is it's he, she, they're going to, I hate the there. I keep falling back into inclusive pronouns. <laughs> Let's go with she, she's going to go to church with me. And she'll fit in so great. I'm sure eventually she'll go to a woman's study. God will caress her with faith someplace along the line. We'll bring up our children in the fear of the Lord. It just may take some time. No, I'm not being at all bitter over the numerous female students I've trained who did that or occasion. It's actually more often the females. Sometimes it's the males who, having been warned over and over again, they can't do this. And they go and do it, and they've got great reasons. Um, one of them recently quoted back to me a line from Pinafore, but daddy, I love him. <laughs> she did it in self-mockery. So we have that whole thing that brought on the flood and destroyed the world. It was this very sin. Coming to the time of the judges. The... the truth of God's beauty being reflected by the image, mm. being more permanent than the corruption of man is important too. That mm. our corruption is so small compared to God's perfection that who, who would we be to think that we could so immediately wipe out <laughs> any image of God's goodness? Yeah, that would be called hell. <laughs> And it was, it did seem to be a real danger when God came calling on Adam and Eve after their first sin. 
But the moment God started talking about life beyond the garden, it became very clear that His grace is greater than all of our sins, and even what we sometimes call common grace, the overflow of special grace into the world around us, uh, is greater than the wrath that awaits us one day. In the meantime, while God is busy redeeming the planet, there will be a great deal of beauty, and, and aesthetic beauty, but also the beauty of character, of personality, of intelligence. There's all kinds of good things that God has left in this world. And sometimes those the people who have these things, they are in fact attractive. They're fun. They It's easy to love them. Why not just take the next step and make it permanent? Perma I can never say that word. Make it <laughs> eternal <laughs> till death and all that. And yet, God says no. He said no and brought a flood on the world. He said no to the same thing in the time of the judges, as Israel repeatedly went after the daughters of strange gods and brought um, judgment and oppression and foreign invasion. He said no to Solomon, and Solomon collected a thousand wives, most of them Gentiles, apparently almost all of them, maybe all of them unbelievers, divided the kingdom, threatened the messianic line. Uh, then there's that, um, this is not quite the same thing, but the kingly line, the Davidic line, marrying into the line of Ahab and Jezebel. Probably nobody involved in there was exactly godly. Well, actually, the, the father of the bridegroom, Jehoshaphat, was godly, and yet he managed to marry off his unbelieving son to Athaliah, the unbelieving daughter of an unbelieving murderous Jezebel. And that almost destroyed the Messianic line. And here we are. Again, it happens in Ezra. It happens in Nehemiah a few years later. And Malachi, who's writing about the same time, he also mentions that this, this was a thing. It's something we keep coming back to. This You talked about this being sort of the climax of this theme. But remember, we're at the end of the Old Testament histories. Mm -hmm. This is kind of the climax of the Old Testament. Uh, we were marveling at how, wow, and God's people obey, and they get rebuked, and they obey, and they get rebuked, and they repent, and they obey. And, and yet we're still seeing the same sin again. And it's still 400 years or more to Christ. And, and we're left hanging, as it were. As this season ends, and we see our hero on the floor bleeding out, and we wonder, oh no, can I wait the summer to see the new season and find out how they're <laughs> going to save him? It's kind of God's covenant promises. It's the hope of Messiah. Uh, these are the people we're trusting with the future of the world, with the plan of God, with the gospel, and they can't even marry the right people? What is going on here, and, and where is this going? And then we go silent for 400 years. Yeah. It's like the scene in Princess Bride hmm. when the bride or the when Buttercup is marrying Humper, Humperdinck, and if you just paused there <laughs> for a good while, no, she can't marry him. No, I guess I guess you're the ruining boy the story, that. Grandpa. She doesn't yeah. marry Humperdinck. She marries Wesley. <laughs> Get it right. Um, you know, and there's a reason we feel so strongly about that, right? Yeah. It's, innate. <laughs> it's innate because we know how it's got to be. If, if salvation exists at all, that's how it has to work. The hero has to survive to accomplish what has to be done. And what happens beyond that? Well, we know how Jesus did it, unfortunately. Fortunately. None of us is Jesus. <laughs> and so none of our heroes... Well, I almost said something ridiculous. Almost said none of our heroes die and rise again. And yet the literature, the fa fantasy literature of the world. <laughs> Let's see. Gandalf, Superman, Captain America, <laughs> Wesley. You know, we keep coming up with this. Yes, death we're going Death cannot stop true love. Death cannot stop true love. Yeah, true love is undying. So what we've seen here in a nutshell. Okay, so this, this was it. This was the summing up. This was the showing. This is an ongoing theme. Covenant faithfulness means that when I marry, when you marry, that marriage is bigger than your needs, your desires, your happiness, your experience with true love. All those things have a place, I suppose. But the thing that 
echoes through eternity is how does this marriage center around and support the kingdom of God, not only right now, but how does it push us into the future? And that's where children come in. The Book of Common Prayer lists three reasons for biblical marriage. First, the mutual society and comfort one ought to have of another. So there's that element of friendship and helping, keeping us from sexual sin, echoing Paul in 1 Corinthians 7. And then, uh, I actually have the words, so I will read them, the procreation of children to be brought up in the fear and nurture of the Lord and to the praise of his holy name. Now, there's a lot of things that the prayer book doesn't say and that scripture doesn't say. Some of them can be included if we get our priorities straight. Uh, God never says, go fall in love and then marry that person. He does say, you got married, love that person. It uh, doesn't talk about meeting your needs or um, fulfilling your dreams. Although if your dreams are godly and your needs are real and you're seeking answers in Christ, marriage may play a part in all of that. The danger is, uh, in our ages, I was going to say that we make marriage an idol. I suppose some people do, but I think more often people, well, that still works. People make something else an idol, and then marriage becomes our way of trying to get at that thing, which ultimately is mm. what idols are, isn't it? So we make mm. something else our God, and then marriage becomes the idol through which we reach out hoping to grab <laughs> our God. Yeah. Uh, and I when do, you do that, you say something, Brian? I, I know that there's a very strong tendency to deny the possibility that marriage can be an idol because in the broader culture it's really not an idol. <laughs> yeah. It's just kind of this quaint historical thing that sometimes mm. you do for tax benefits. <laughs> um yeah. And you know that's certainly true but for those living in a Christian subculture at the very least um and a post-Christian culture that we are now it it can be very much an idol to essentially say this is how I get at being a godly person. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think there are a lot of people who do that. Um, you know, our, our favorite punching bags in Moscow, for, for instance, <laughs> but um, it, it's, it's a, it's a real temptation. And like you said, I, I hadn't quite heard it put, put that way before. It's like marriage isn't always the thing that we're trying to get at. It's normally other things using marriage as an idol. It's an illicit use of marriage, even mm -hmm. though I, w I wouldn't ever claim that the marriage itself was illicit for trying to do <laughs> that, but it definitely is a case of disordered priorities. Yeah. And it, it is, it has become for a brief time in American Christian culture, I think a time that may now have passed there was all the supla about getting to marriage, getting there the right way, on the right terms, doing courtship just right, all of that. Because if you get there and do that, then you will be blessed. Mm -hmm. And right. you're guaranteed never to have your heart broken. Yes. Oh, and if you if you do that right, <laughs> then you're also guaranteed to get married in the first place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is really weird when the steps towards marriage include never pursuing anyone ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm glad I missed all that, but that came along just a couple of years before I actually got married and I did, I when when I ran into the idea of courtship, I knew exactly what it meant because I'm a medievalist. I study ancient history. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I could explain to people exactly what was going on with it, but then as it became more and more of this manufactured thing done in the flesh. We mm -hmm. have rules. Follow these rules. Some of them you've never heard of and neither is anyone else, but they're rules that are great and they're godly and godly <laughs> people will embrace them and you'll have a great marriage. Um, well, it's I, certainly I happening. most of that. It's certainly happening in um, ideas of, around child rearing as well. Mm. As long as you do X, Y, and Z, your children will not fall away. <laughs> and uh, it, no. may be it may be true <laughs> that God would use those means, yeah. you know, we, we don't want to, 
No, oh, God, he's just. I don't want. To, I don't want to heap burdens on people because I know no. that homeschooling and private schooling is not always feasible for individuals. But you know, I I think that is a ideal to strive for and to advocate for. And yes, we we recognize the propriety of parents being the ones to make decisions about Uh their children and you know what they're taught but i know several families who did all the right things they did all the right Mm -hmm. homeschooling co-ops and their some of their children fell away praise god a couple of them came back Mm -hmm. to the faith um but for the most part not at least at this point, obviously. At this point, we can't see the future. We can't see the future. Mm-hmm. Maybe those seeds have been planted well enough and God will use them to grow the trees of faith. Mm-hmm. But it is such a... And again, it applies to marriage too. It's like when when you try to say, here here's the way to do it so that you never experience sadness mm-hmm. or you never experience loss, it is a recipe for disappointment. Mm -hmm. Even if things work out better than it should, (laughs) um, (laughs) because you think it's going to be this ideal and without recognizing the possibility for non-ideal states of being, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you're going to come away from that disappointed. I I, actually, I just saw a clip yesterday, I think from, um, Victor Frankel. I'm not mm. sure if you've heard of him. Oh, yes. Oh, Man's Search for Meaning. It's actually, I, I really enjoy that book. It's it's such an interesting read. But uh, one of the things in the clip, it wasn't about uh, Man's Search for Meaning. He was talking about optimists and mm-hmm. pessimists. And he said, optimists are actually the only realists. Because optimists see the world for what it could be Mm -hmm. and they aim for it Mm -hmm. and they always fall short because you can't ever hit that ideal but without the ideal to strive for you're you're aiming lower and falling lower than the low thing you aimed for (laughs) and Mm -hmm. so it's always going to be worse than the reality but if you aim for an ideal and you know you could draw this out to truth and faith as well it's like if you have an ideal morality which we find in the Ten Commandments, in Scripture, in in the life of Jesus, then, yeah, you're going to fall short of that, but it's going to be better for you striving to reach that in your own personal piety and the work, uh, the sanctification of the Spirit. I just thought that was so interesting. It's like, I can see the truth in that, even though it's not 100% correct. Mm -hmm. It's funny. I I must have seen that on a YouTube feed or something, because... When she started, Victor Frankl came up, and yes, the optimism, pessimism. I don't think I clicked on it, unfortunately. <laughs> but that's uh, for those of you who do not know, Victor Frankl was um, um, confined in a German death camp during the war, and uh, survived. And his book is in part a description of of what it was like. And he came to this conclusion: those who lived with purpose who had a hope, who had a vision that reached beyond just surviving day by day, survived and and in some small measure thrived. Those who just saw the next task and nothing more generally died. You have to live by hope. And he's a Jewish existentialist, more or less. Uh, But the book is well worth reading. Very much recommend it. Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Well, we were So we've talked about why <laughs> talked about background now. <laughs> why why romance is innate. I mean, we hadn't used that word yet, mm. romance, but what I mean by that is this idea that the hero should marry his bride, mm-hmm. the one he's meant for and she's meant for him. Uh let's bring that back to the restoration era. God's people lost sight somehow of what they were doing. And I think, I haven't thought this through, so I'm just throwing this out and feel free to expand on it. We have two things going on here. We have the rebuilding of the temple and how they get so easily deflected from that. And then the building of the walls. But now it's the holy city, so 
this 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 holy we're building this place that's holy and at the same time we're we're trying to build a community and yet we're trying to build it with the wrong people and there's there's a parallel here the the temple the city are god's bride israel is god's bride in both cases we're trying to build into the future and lack of faith is the common denominator uh, the the future and a failure to pursue the future in terms of faith are what brings us here to the end of the Old Testament, kind of like getting to the end of Judges, where you say, it doesn't get any better than this. But this time, Jesus is just around the corner. If 400 years is just around the corner. <laughs> yeah. Compared to 4,000 <laughs> years, it's, it's not bad. Yeah. Um, in the case of Ezra, we might as well fill in the history for those who may not know it. Uh, Ezra is a a priest. He's a scribe of God's law. He has purpose to, to understand and study the law and to be able to teach it well. And he's gone to the emperor and asked for permission and, and such and support to go back to Jerusalem and teach the law of God to God's people. And the emperor gives him thumbs up. Um, and so he goes and, and he's this is his heart's desire, to teach the word of God, to build up God's people so that they will be living stones in a living temple dedicated to the service of God. And he gets there, and, and barely is he set foot on the ground when people come and say, uh, boss, we got a problem here. A lot of people have married pagan wives, and a lot of the people who did this are, well, our leaders. So it's kind of a mess. And it looks like you get to fix it. We'll help if we can. That's all. <laughs> uh, it's not what he wanted. It's not what he signed on for. This was not the plan. He was looking forward to some kind of great revival uh, of investing in the lives of these people with the word of God, of building them up, teaching them, instructing them, all that. Hoping to train up a generation that be ready for what's coming. And he finds out that they've already screwed things up a lot. Uh, and the solution that presents itself is, is probably surprising to most Christians. The solution is, well, these men who have married pagan wives need to divorce their wives. In our culture, we would probably say annul the marriages. Mm -hmm. And that's what the rest of the book is. Ezra, But the book ends, and Ezra hasn't got to do anything except preside over the greatest series of divorces in redemptive history and, and maybe in the history of the world. That's not it. That's not what he's <laughs> here for. That's not what? what anybody really wants. Divorce is not a happy ending. No, this is not a happy ending. But that's where we leave Ezra in, in his book. Mm -hmm. uh, he he sees that this this will destroy Israel. This will destroy the promise. This will destroy the covenant. This will destroy the future. Uh, it's got to be stopped, and it, there's no pretty way to stop this. Some people have asked me, well, does that mean that the wives just get kicked out? More probably, they're still responsible for taking care of their wives, sending them the alimony. But they're not going to be married anymore, and um, God legitimatizes this. this. This is what God wants, because marriage is, on the one hand, it's not about being in love, although being in love is always nice. Well, it's not always nice, but if it's done in a godly fashion, <laughs> it's always nice. It certainly can be a wonderful thing. But it's not where the Bible puts its emphasis. It's that, that kind of, of romantic fervor that we find in Song of Solomon is the result of obedience to God. When you are faithful, when you trust God, when you walk with Him, when you commit your marriage to Him, when you work it out day by day, then those kind of things come along, and they're wonderful. But trying to turn it around sort of like the revivalism in American culture. Well, at the beginning, the Holy Spirit came and people got emotional. So if we get emotional, then the Holy Spirit will come, right? <laughs> it's kind of like in, in marriage, when you're making decisions based on how you feel, even if how you feel is really accommodating and sweet and yeah. in love, those are not always the decisions that are building up your marriage. No, they're not. It's, it's the decisions that you make in order to bring your lives into greater harmony mm. intentionally, even when you don't want to, when you are even, building something new together. That right. takes work. Even when you don't want to. 
Well, then we pass to the book of Nehemiah, and we've talked some about Nehemiah. He goes back to rebuild the walls and is, is successful there. Also addresses some matters of civil justice and cultural reform. But as we get to the end of Nehemiah's book, he suddenly finds out the same thing's happening again. Uh, Israelites are marrying people from non, non-Israelite, non non-God-fearing cultures. And it's gone on long enough that they have children, and these children aren't even speaking good Hebrew anymore, or Aramaic, or whatever they were speaking at the time. The, the cultural transmission is broken down to the point where fathers can't even communicate clearly to their children, and grandparents are shut completely out. And at this time, the faith is mostly summed up in, in Hebrew, with Aramaic being a close runner. Yes, the Septuagint will be written eventually, but we really aren't there yet. So if you can't speak Hebrew, you don't know the Word of God. Um, and that's the condition we're in. And so Nehemiah addresses the same thing. He's a little more forceful <laughs> than Ezra. When Ezra heard about this, he fell down on his knees and, and prayed and repented for Israel's sins. And then and, and in the process, pulled out his own hair and rent his clothes. This is what Nehemiah writes. So I contended with them and cursed them and struck some of them and pulled out their hair and made them swear by God, saying, you shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or yourselves. So very forceful, um, pulling out their hair, striking them, cursing them. Uh, Again, our culture isn't ready to handle someone like Nehemiah. That's just too in your face, too violent, too unkind, too unloving, not accepting enough. I mean, these people love each other. More than that, these people have made commitments. So, you know, marriage is sacred. You can't violate marriage. Well, both these men did because the marriages were illegitimate in the first place. Israel is God's wife, and they're not permitted to marry the daughter of a false god. To marry the daughter of a false god is to come into covenant relationship with that God. Paul says something very similar in 1 Corinthians 10. You can't eat of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. This kind of communion doesn't work. It's going to be one or the other. Yeah. You got to serve somebody. You can only be in fellowship with one. What communion hath light with darkness? We all know a passage in 2 Corinthians where Paul Paul's not exactly even talking about marriage, although it certainly has that application. But be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what part hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? You are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in you and walk in you. You'll be my God. I'll, uh, I'll be your God. You'll be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will be father to you. You'll be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. That's the issue. This is we are our generation is all about relationships. <laughs> we never stop and define what in the world that means and why it's a good thing, if it is. And yet the Bible got there first. The Bible is a book about relationships, but the central person we're supposed to have a relationship with the triune God of Scripture. And everything else has to pale before that. And anything that's contrary to that, we have to let go. And when we've walked down the wrong road, seeking the wrong kind of communion, we may have to backpedal really hard. Because there's more at stake than my happiness. You know, there are there are people who marry, there are Christians who marry unbelievers, and they remain faithful, and they have more or less happy lives. But their faith is compromised, their obedience is compromised, the future is compromised. And even if they go to their grave saying, well, we had a nice marriage. Well, you know what? It's not about you. <laughs> and that's a hard thing for 21st century Americans to grasp. It's not about me. No, really isn't. It's about God. Now, if we love God and if we are faithful in, in God in, in completing his joy, we'll complete ours too. We will be blessed. But when we turn it around and try, even in something as personal as marriage, to meet our needs and our wants and our desires and our emotional quota, our romantic dreams, we will not get what we think we're going to get. And as a teacher of high school students, I have seen this far, far too often. Uh, and it's not for lack of telling on my part and warning. <laughs> I can attest to that. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
You know, yeah, I think we talked about marriage in every single class. <laughs> really? That yeah, most days, too. I, I <laughs> think there's a similar <laughs> Maybe number. not most days, but every class, yeah, at some time or other. Yeah. Okay. I had a thought. I mean, it, it is a very important thing to discuss with, mm-hmm. you know, people on the cusp of adulthood. <laughs> Maybe if I hammer this in enough, they'll listen. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? That too can easily become a thing of the flesh. Yeah. If I do this, then no, that's not how it works. Yeah. If I it's... have the right attitude about marriage, then I will be perfect in marriage, yeah. <laughs> and my marriage will be perfect. I yeah. remember so many people. I don't. I don't know that any of the people that I heard it directly from were saying it as like, Here, "Here's how to get married soon," but. It was always funny where they're like, it's so weird. It's like the minute I stopped caring about marriage, I found someone I wanted to marry. (laughs) Yeah, that's... While we're busy pursuing our idols, God tends not to grant our wishes as much. If he does, then be afraid. Be very afraid. (laughs) What was it? I remember uh, you telling the story of Haman casting lots for what day? And it was no, 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 no. For a long while down the Mm. calendar. And then it was... Yes. It's like, okay, cool. It's like, oh, you should have been afraid. There was like 365 Balaam. days in a year. Yeah. And you- <laughs> Same with Balaam wanting to go with the Moabites, right? Yeah. God yeah. says, yeah, go with the Moabites. See what happens. <laughs> oh, dear. The amazing thing is that sometimes, and I, I hesitate even to say it, but experience says that sometimes God is just overabundantly gracious. And actually, in spite of our sin and unbelief, he saves he saves that unsaved person we're in love with. <laughs> um, and it's just really, Lord, that's not how I would have done it. Yes, because we're not as cool and loving and gracious as God. <laughs> Having said that, that is not an invitation for anyone to try that. Mm-hmm. Oh, maybe yeah. I'll be one of those. Maybe <sighs> maybe God will save my boyfriend, my girlfriend, because. He's he's greater than my sins. He's smarter than me. I bet that's what he's planned all along. Don't do that. Well, it, it bears a, a similarity to uh, some arguments I've seen in favor of open communion. And like their, oh. <laughs> their sincere argument of saying, like, just let anyone who wants come to the table. No fencing, no like giving, not uh. even like what the OPC often does, which is to say like, mm-hmm. if you're a Christian, you're welcome. And if you're a member in a church, you're welcome. If you're not, please don't. Yeah. <laughs> not even that, but saying like, you're in this church, come drink and eat. And it's like, the argument is like, Judas ate too. And I'm like, yeah, and that's, that's, that should <laughs> that's not, not be, a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> that should not you, be your yeah. argument here. <laughs> yeah. I think it's something like, that may be missing there. And this would take some exegesis to prove it. But the the danger is not merely to the one who eats and drinks unworthily. Mm-hmm. It's to the whole covenanted community. Mm-hmm. There, by God's wrath is provoked against the whole church. Yeah. The book of Jude. <laughs> yeah. Um, These people have crept in. You need to take care of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. the, the judgments may not simply be to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are responsible for the purity of the body of Christ. And here, Francis Schaeffer's book, The Church Before the Watching World, I recommend, uh, there's a section on practicing the purity of the visible church, which he balances with the mark of the Christian, which is love. So, yes, the love that reaches out and rescues and accepts and receives, at the same time, the holiness which protects the bride. Both are true manifestations of the gospel. And without both of those, we lose the future. I suppose the third thing which undergirds them both is simply truth. Uh, we, none of us has the truth down pat completely. We all make mistakes. We all have doctrinal errors someplace that we may never discover in this life. And yet the basic, the basic doctrines of Scripture are pretty clear and have been for, you know, 2,000 years. And it's not that hard to find out if you're a rank heretic. <laughs> um, the moment, the moment you say, a I, bit of discovery to do, but <laughs> most of the time. Most of the time. The moment you say, wait, I've got an idea that no one's ever thought of before. You're 
might just be a heretic. <laughs> uh, but if we walk in the truth, if we maintain love and maintain purity by grace, by turning to Christ, holding on to Christ, keeping eyes fixed on Christ, then God is generally pleased to do great things, but he does them on his own time schedule. And we <laughs> want them, you know, right now. Yeah. You know. Um, I mean, we want the world saved tomorrow. I do, at least. Uh, but it's probably not going to happen that way. But I have got to the point where I'm no longer content to say, well, you know, thousand, ten thousand year. I'm at the point of saying, Lord, you promised a lot. This may be rude and this may be out of line, but I would like you to start doing some things right now where we can see them in our lifetime. Mm. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the worst he can say is one day, it's like, that was really out of line. <laughs> I said so at the time. Does that count? But, uh, well, it's funny how many errors in the Old Testament, sins in the Old Testament, we can look at as the bride being impatient mm, and trying yeah. to do things by herself. That's a good point. There was a point. time in. American history where a bridegroom would build a house. Right. That was his role. And the bride would have a hope chest and it's, she's working for her premarital lifespan to fill it with things with which to fill the house. Right. And mm. so when we look at our role as the church, as being to fill the house that God is building, we don't get to move in ahead of time. <laughs> like, I mean, my, my analogy is not, not really well thought out here. And I'm, <laughs> I'm winging it, I confess. But we can't fill it on our own terms. We can't build it. Mm -hmm. God is the one to build it. Um, he is the one that brings people into the church. We don't endorse date to save for a reason. <laughs> Flirt to convert. Also right out. Um, it's. It's God who builds the house. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the trusting God to build the house, trusting the bridegroom to prepare the place for us is kind of what, what we have to do. And we're, we're here knitting tablecloths or whatever, spiritually, um, mm -hmm. to try and be prepared and to be obedient and to populate that's not you know populate today like hmm. the dual <laughs> meaning of populate meaning not just with people but to like when you put all the ornaments on the christmas tree that's populating right. the christmas tree right like yeah. that's what populating a table yeah, yeah. That, that's what i mean here is Telling that in. yeah when when god created the earth he told adam and eve to fill it it's the same thing you know it's and when we try to do that in our own terms, we start trying to build the house. Mm -hmm. And that's not our job. The, the end. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on that note. On that note, um, we've had some recommendations uh, in passing. Uh, we had a suggestion that we should give people something to fight about in our recommendation section today. What, I is, where I what is the best book to movie adaptation mm -hmm. that you know of. Now, the emphasis here is on the adapting. It doesn't have to be your favorite book or your favorite movie. It's just that the director, producer, actress did a fantastic job of making the transition. Uh, my first thought was um, Maltese Falcon because they use the text of the book as the shooting script. <laughs> but I, I immediately got booed down on that one in favor of certain Jane Austen things. So Not that, by that's, me. <laughs> I will but, be. I mean, I wasn't there. There, <laughs> there are doubtless many other things. You know, you, you, could, you could actually do the other, which would probably be boring, which is which movies have been made into successful books. Probably um, none. But... Uh, <laughs> The Princess Bride. <laughs> no, the book came first. Did it? No. Yeah. I, I have the a movie's conspiracy better than theory the book, about yeah. that. <laughs> Does it involve um, uh, a blue box with a Britishman? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And then um, someone suggested, what is your favorite shape of pasta? To which I replied spaghetti and got shut down in multiple directions on that one. Because I'm just um, simplistic and old fashioned. I just Brian? forgot the name of it. Uh, it's 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 actually like shaped almost like a um, like a conch shell. I've only seen shell it once. Pasta. It was it was in no not not a shell pasta. It's no. it's like it's almost like a macaroni except that it's longer and looped in on itself circular. Huh. I have no idea. Wait, and like a was, corkscrew? Yeah, like a cork, uh, but. Not not a corkscrew because that's a rotini. It's something else, and I I only ever saw it in one person's video making a <laughs> pasta recipe on <laughs> YouTube, and I can't find it again. And he didn't say the name of the pasta, and I'm mad at him, <laughs> <laughs> whoever it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, as far as best uh, book to movie adaptation, I'm going to put in uh, holes. Mm. Oh, good one. I actually haven't read the book. I feel like a, a sham for having suggested that, but I, I've been told it is like a perfect, just like the same thing as Maltese Falcon. Like they just lifted it yeah. straight Pretty much. from the author of the book was the screenwriter. Also another yeah. one in the same vein is my wife's favorite movie, which is on no streaming platform. I always feel bad recommending it because it's like, you can't find it. Uh, my family and other animals mm. because uh, it was like an old masterpiece classics from the, the from the early 2000s uh it has i forgot the is it imelda staunton who played um umbridge Dolores umbridge yeah she's the mom and name. she's delightful she's amazing in that yes <laughs> um but we started reading the book and she my wife grew up on this on this movie like she watched it multiple times it was at the library she always rented it she, she like just about wore out the dvd that they had on uh on the shelves there we started reading the book and it's incredible how many of the scenes are just lifted straight from the book and put into the script so that's my other vote and i have read both so i can recommend that one in good faith <laughs> 84 cheering cross road comes to mind too mm. very similarly taking the book and Using it as a shooting script. Anyway, uh, those of you who have not yet sent us a recommendation, you're running out of time. These are just some things to poke at you and prodging. If if we rouse you to say, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Obviously, the answer is, well, then good. <laughs> Send us something. <laughs> so we're, we'll be getting to that not next time, but the time after, I believe. Mm-hmm. So, that sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. I think- Neato. Uh, I, I'm partial to shell pasta of any size. Manicotti's great, but I like the the really small ones. If you make them with like a butter garlic sauce, and it just mm. gets all in there, that's real good. Um, and I think specifically the BBC Pride and Prejudice is mm. a wonderful adaptation, but I don't feel like it's quite fair because it's a mini series, not a book. So they have a little bit more time to work with which is usually the challenge right emma was really close for me except it's just a little bit weak on mr knightley at the very end um they they, he says something very modern and Mm. uh, aside from that emma gwyneth paltrow the oh yes yeah that one like i am always amazed whenever i watch it or whenever i read emma how they fit the entire book into two hours. Like it's a normal <laughs> length movie and it's, it's mm-hmm. exceptional except for that little weakness in Mr. Knightley at the very end. Um, but I will put in a good word for true grit, the Coen brothers mm. adaptation. Uh-huh. Yeah. The, the, that's a good one. The experience of watching the movie is very similar to the experience of reading the book, which mm. is not at all true of the John Wayne no. version. So that's my tuppence. All right. Does those count as our recommendations for today? I think they should. Although, did you say your favorite pasta, the best pasta? Yeah, spaghetti. Oh, you did. Sorry. I, I must have... <laughs> I must have been temporarily disembodied because I <laughs> didn't hear that because I would have fought you on that. I don't think spaghetti is a very good pasta shape. I think it's the worst pasta shape. It's so it's basic. Kind of, that's kind of what I got from my family, actually. <laughs> what can I say? I'm old fashioned. There was a time that when that was all we knew in America back in the old days. Spaghetti. Is it? 
Anyway, so there anyway. we go. <laughs> That's all for today, folks. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you also to David, our producer, and my lovely wedded husband. Uh, thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Uh, if you, listener, would like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash haltingtowardszion or patreon.com slash haltingtowardszion. You can get in touch with us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Send us your recommendations. Send us your thoughts, feedback, ideas about what you'd like to hear from us in the future. We're coming up on a break, and we'd just love to hear from you. Hope you enjoyed listening as much as we enjoyed talking at you this evening. See you next time.